Maintaining alkalinity in your tank is one of the secrets to a thriving reef aquarium. But how do you keep it stable? In this video, I'll share my go-to methods and explore other strategies to keep your out short for alkalinity rock solid. So what exactly is alkalinity? It measures your water's ability to neutralize acid. Think of it as a buffer that stabilizes your pH rather than an actual element like calcium, iron, or copper. When I was a kid, I struggled to understand this concept. The good news is you can test and dose alkalinity just like any other element element in your aquarium. In practical terms, alkalinity refers to the level of bicarbonates, carbonates, and sometimes hydroxides in your water. These compounds are essential for corals and other calcifying organisms that they rely on to build their skeleton. In a closed system like an aquarium, these alkalinity compounds get used up over time. Without proper replenishment, alkalinity levels will drop, leading to unstable pH and stressed corals. The good news, aquariums can usually handle small alkalinity swings, just not sudden ones. For example, if your dosing pump stops working for a week and you didn't catch it. A heavily stocked coral tank might see an alkalinity drop from 8 dKH to 5 dKH in those seven days. While that's not ideal, it's not necessarily catastrophic. The worst thing you could do in this situation is to quickly raise the alkalinity back up to 8 dKH. Instead, bring it up gradually about 1 dKH every one to two days until it's back within your target range. After all, it didn't drop from 8 to 5 in one day, it dropped in about a week. So it's very important that you don't shock the system the second way because your corals are probably okay with the 5 dKH. You know, you could actually hurt the system more by bringing it back up within an hour or two. Alkalinity naturally fluctuates in the ocean and in your tank throughout the day. Over the past year, my alkalinity has swung between 7 dKH to 8.5 dKH. Anytime it drops, I know it's time to increase the dose. When it rises, it's time to investigate why my consumption has gone down. It could mean other parameters need attention. Maybe my skimmer stopped working, causing my pH to drop, or my phosphates hit zero. Any one of these things could cause your corals to use less alkalinity, which will cause the dosing to be over that I had originally planned for. My Calcwasser method. My favorite method is Calcwasser. It's simple, effective, and affordable compared to other methods. I mix calc powder with RODI water in my 30 gallon drum every week or as needed. As my tank has matured and my drum starts emptying faster than my evaporation rate, I'll eventually need to switch to dosing two part solution. But for now, calc is my go to. The biggest advantage for calc over two part solution is that it boosts both alkalinity and calcium in equal concentration. That means I don't have to deal with multiple dosing pumps or solution. Plus, calcwasa has an added benefit of significantly raising pH, which I found to be far more effective at maintaining a stable pH in my aquarium compared to two-part solution. Since alkalinity isn't a physical element, Calcwasser acts as a buffer that solves three problems. It stabilizes pH, alkalinity, and calcium levels. In contrary, two-part tackles only two problems but requires two dosing pump and double the effort. Unless you're setting it up with a reliable dosing pump, I wouldn't recommend using calc as a primary source for dosing alkalinity in your system. However, if you're running something like a calcium reactor as your primary method and have a fixed amount of calc added to a freshwater container, then it could work. Usually, people that have calcium reactors use calc to boost up their pH because the calcium reactor will depress the pH in their system. Most new tanks won't have significant alkalinity and calcium consumption during the first year, so don't stress about this aspect early on too much. Focus on getting your tank up and running first and worry about dosing later. Even in a large system, the alkalinity demand started small and has grown gradually. I began dosing um, 1,000 milliliters per day and have now increased to 9,000 milliliters per day. I believe I can continue using calc for another year before needing to supplement it with two-part solution. The reason for this is that calc wasser has a maximum saturation point in fresh water. Once you've added the maximum amount of calc powder, the remainder won't dissolve and it will settle at the bottom of the container. The liquid portion, which should have a pH of 12, is what gets dosed. However, your tank daily evaporation rates limits how much calc you can dose in your 24-hour period. Once your system's alkalinity and calcium demands exceeds what can be supplied through your evaporation rate, you'll need to supplement that amount. I haven't reached that point yet, but when I do, I plan to start by dosing two part weekly to boost levels. If the consumption becomes very high, I might even add a calcium reactor. There's a common concern that lower pH associated with calcium reactors could harm corals growth, but
but in my opinion, this is overblown. Corals have thrived in calcium reactor systems for years, even with slightly lower pH levels. In fact, I've stopped obsessing over pH entirely. For years, I would check twice a day and try everything like opening windows, repositioning fans around the tank, or adding extra pumps to the sump to raise it. While some of these methods work, I've realized the real focus should be on keeping the primary parameters stable and preventing things like nitrates and phosphates from spiraling out of control. Here you can see me mixing calc in my 30 gallon reservoir. Once mixed, calc loses its potency when exposed to air. So I use a airtight seal container to prevent degradation. So far, I haven't seen significant alkalinity swings between mixing fresh batch of couch and using an older one, which leads me to believe it's remaining stable between refills. My mixing process is straightforward. I add a one and one quarter cups of calc to my container, ensuring it's thoroughly mixed, seal the container, and then turn the dosing pump back on. Currently, I only need to adjust my dosing pump setting once a month. When I find myself needing to tweak it weekly, I know my tank is thriving and consuming more. Currently, I'm dosing 24 hours a day on a consistent cycle, so it's constantly dropping uh, calc into my system. When I was chasing my pH, I would actually manipulate the dosing, so I would have it dosing at night, then dosing during the day, and honestly, it became a little bit of a challenge, so I just now run it on a 24-hour cycle. In the past, when I used two-part dosing, weekly adjustments were the norm. I suspect that calc's ability to stabilize alkalinity levels reduces the need for constant fine-tuning, similar to a calcium reactor uses experience with both alkalinity and calcium stability. ATO method. With my dosing pump, I use a fully saturated calc washer solution. If I need to increase the alkalinity dosing, I can easily adjust it by tweaking the pump settings using an ATO reservoir of calc. However, making precise adjustments makes it much more difficult. The only practical way I can see this working is to start with half or less saturated solution and slowly adding more calc to boost levels. But honestly, this approach sounds like a headache. Unless you're using another method to main alkalinity like the calcium reactor I mentioned earlier and only relying on a fixed amount of calc, I'd recommend sticking with something like a dedicated a dosing pump for more precise and safety. If something went wrong, like an ATO dumping a large amount of fresh water into your system, you could end up with a massive pH spike that could instantly kill everything in your aquarium. This is one of the reasons why many hobbyists from the 80s and 90s moved away from calc washer. There were countless horror stories about the catastrophic tank crashes. However, I think a lot of those issues stem from people using it incorrectly due to the lack of information available at the time. Today, we have a wealth of information at our fingertips, but just because it's good for some someone else doesn't mean it, it can't be bad for you. Don't be a sheep. Follow every piece of advice that comes your way. Sometimes you need to filter out the good from the bad. For example, just because Chris Meckley from ACI dumps a bunch of saturated calc water into his tank at night and sees incredible results doesn't mean it's practical or safe for your system. His farm is in a garage. He probably opens the door every day, gets fresh air in there. He's in this Florida sun. There are countless variables at play that make his approach work for him, but may not work for you. Let's be honest doing something every night in your reef tank isn't practical for most people. What happens when you go on vacation? Are you really going to ask a buddy to dump a ton of calc into your system every night? Calc stir. I was very close to using a calc stir connected to my dosing pump, and I'm glad I didn't for a number of reasons. With a 1500 square foot basement, I have enough space for a large freshwater container that I could fill with calc and RODI water. Mix and seal airtight. This setup works perfectly for me and avoids the additional maintenance that comes with a calc stir. That being said, if the space is limited for you and the equipment needs to fit under your tank stand, a calc stir can be a great option. These reactors allow you to add a substantial amount of calc powder and as your dosing pump pushes water through the system, through the reactor, it mixes the RO water with a calc before discharging a fully saturated solution into your sump. The downsides, you'll need to keep a close eye on the calc levels and ensure the stir remains clear. Calc has a tendency to stick to everything and I can easily imagine the reactor becoming cloudy and hard to see inside it. To avoid issues, make sure you plan to service the reactor every few weeks or as recommended by the manufacturer. Another drawback for me is the cost. I understand this hobby serves a niche market and prices have to be higher for com companies to make a profit. However, I wish the manufacturers or suppliers of calc would offer more affordable reactor options. Lower price might encourage more hobbies to adopt this method, which in turn could boost sales of their calc products. I've been using BRS 2 part for a while now, and I absolutely love it. What hooked me was the easy to use calculators on their website. You just enter your tank's water volume, current levels, and desired range, and it tells you exactly the amount you need to dose. For example, if I want to raise my alkalinity, I input the precise water volume of my system and my target range. Here's a crucial tip. 
Don't assume you know your tank's water volume before starting. Use a BRS water volume calculator. Measure the actual dimensions, length, width, and height of the water in your tank, excluding the glass. Do the same for the sump. Add those volumes together and subtract about 5-10% to to account for displacement from rock and sand. This ensures your dosing is as accurate as possible. In my 115 gallon tank, with a total water volume of 127 gallons, including the sump, I knew that dosing 10 ml of soda ash raised my alkalinity by 0.1 dKH. This is incredibly handy. For instance, if I test my alkalinity and it's at 8.5 dKH, but after a week it drops to 8 dKH, I know I just need to increase my daily dose of soda ash by 7 mLs per day. Then I test again after 3 days. If it stabilizes at 8 dKH, I leave it as that and knew my adjustment was good. I, I do wait until it gets down to about 7.5 dKH before manually dosing it back up. One important thing to keep in mind, water changes can significantly impact alkalinity. For example, with most salt mixes, a 25% water change can cause a noticeable rise in your alkalinity. Unless you're running your alkalinity at 10 dKH, it could bring up the alkalinity more than you would like. If my alkalinity jumped to 9 dKH after a water change, I simply turn up the doser for 24 hours and let it drop naturally. Just don't forget to turn the doser back on. Testing alkalinity, my experience and tips. If you've never tested alkalinity, let me assure you it's one of the easiest and least painful tests in the marine hobby. Using a HANA checker, the process takes about a minute. A titration-based test kit doesn't take much longer. My first alkalinity test kit was an API, but I quickly found it wasn't accurate enough for maintaining sensitive corals. I recommend using Salifers, Red Sea, or even better, HANA checker for precision. One drawback with the HANA checker is having to regularly purchase reagent, which is why I test less frequently than I'd like. However, after years of testing, you develop a sense of when something might be off. For instance, I walk past my sump at least four times a day, always check to ensure my calc is dripping properly. I have an indicator on my container to signal when it needs refilling, but the clear tubing can become cloudy. On a few occasions, I've caught it drying up. This is one of the most critical factors for stability, ensuring your dosing pump working correctly and your containers stay filled. When I first started testing alkalinity, I made the mistake of testing at different times of the day. This is problematic because like pH, alkalinity fluctuates throughout the day. Testing at inconsistent times can result in misleading readings, which might lead to incorrect adjustment of the dosing. Now, I make it a habit to record the time of each test and aim to test around the same time every day. By doing this, I can log the alkalinity reading and avoid making unnecessary changes until I have a consistent data over multiple tests. Over time, this process has become second nature and I've naturally fallen into the routine of testing alkalinity at night. Testing at a consistent time not only simplifies the process, but also provides a reliable insight into your tank stability, helping you make better dosing decisions. I target a range of 7 to 8 dKH, which I found ideal for my tank. My SPS corals seem more resilient at these levels as they closely resemble natural seawater. Anytime my alkalinity exceeds 9 dKH, I stop dosing completely until it drops back to 8. I feel the best level for my tank is 7 dKH. When testing, I compare my current results to the previous ones. For example, if my alkalinity drops from 8.4 dKH to 8.2 dKH, I note it but don't make any changes yet. A few days later, if it drops further to 8 dKH, I know it's time to increase my calc dosing. After increasing Increasing the dosing, I test again in a few days and check if the results stabilize it to 8.2 dKH. And then I know I made the right adjustment. A gradual drop in alkalinity is a good sign that your tank is thriving. In fact, testing alkalinity helps me fine tune my light intensity in the past. When my alkalinity consumption increased, it indicated that my corals were responding positively to the adjusted lighting. On the flip side, if the alkalinity starts rising, it's usually not a good sign. However, don't overreact to a single test result or chase specific numbers like 7.5. 0.5 dKH. Instead, aim for a range. If my alkalinity was 6.5 dKH, I'd keep it there and raise it very slowly over time. The goal is consistency, not perfection. A stable range is far more important than hitting an exact number. Alkalinity testing when done right can be a powerful tool for maintaining a healthy and thriving reef system. Getting good at testing alkalinity and tracking trends over time helped me make better decisions for my reef tank. If you're new to this, it might take some time to see the patterns, but always take stock of your tank. Write down your out test results and log any changes you make like water changes, adding carbon, or introducing new livestock. One more thing, always monitor your specific gravity. It can drop faster than you think, especially if your skimmer is pulling out a lot of water every week. Paying attention to these details will keep your reef tank happy and healthy in the long run. Calcium testing, a change perspective. 
I'll admit, I haven't tested calcium in over a year since my last ICP test. My calcium test kits are over 7 years old now, and I don't see much value in testing frequently since dosing calcwasa solution puts an equal portion of alk and calcium to the system. While some people dose different amounts for alkalinity and calcium, this approach never felt right to me. If I noticed calcium dropping below 400 parts per million, I would give it a boost, but calcium doesn't fluctuate as quickly as alkalinity. After years of religiously testing calcium and overlooking alkalinity, I flipped my focus Focus and it's been a great decision. No matter which method you choose, regular testing is key. I test alkalinity weekly to make sure I'm hitting the sweet spots and remember every tank is different. If your corals are growing fast, you might need to adjust your dosing schedule. So that's how I maintain alkalinity in my reef tank. What's your go-to method? Let me know in the comments section. Until next time, peace out.